Lateral chest radiographs can sometimes intimidate radiology residents. After this talk, however, not only do I think you'll feel way more confident about approaching them, I think there's a good chance some of you may actually look forward to reading them too. We're going to break down this talk into four parts, beginning with a review of anatomy on a lateral chest radiograph. The trachea is an air-filled tube surrounded by soft tissue and is visible as a long vertical dark rectangle in the upper chest that's oriented slightly obliquely so that its superior end is slightly more anterior and its inferior end is slightly more posterior. Here's a magnified view. And here's the trachea in a different patient. In some patients, the anterior margin of the tracheal air column can appear corrugated due to prominent tracheal cartilage rings. In some older patients, tracheal cartilage rings can even appear calcified. Here's one final image that not only shows the trachea, but also a thin esophageal temperature probe that nicely illustrates how the esophagus course is immediately posterior and parallel to the trachea. The lower lobar bronchi are often also visible on the lateral chest radiograph as a pair of smaller width dark rectangles that extend inferiorly from the tracheal air column. Since the left upper lobe bronchus has a transverse course, we're usually steering right down its barrel on a lateral chest radiograph. As a consequence, the air column within the left upper lobe of bronchus will appear as a nice black circle on a lateral image. The right upper lobe bronchus has a relatively transverse course too, and it's also often visible as a black circle on lateral images, just superior to the level of the left upper lobe bronchus. The straight linear interface along the posterior margin of the tracheal air column corresponds to the posterior tracheal wall from the thoracic inlet to a level just above the right upper lobe bronchus. This linear interface will appear to continuously course inferiorly past the level of the right upper lobe bronchus, but at that point will represent the posterior wall of the bronchus intermedius. The right and the left pulmonary arteries will appear differently on a lateral chest radiograph because of their different anatomy. Not only is the right pulmonary artery longer than the left pulmonary artery, the anatomy of both pulmonary arteries um, from a lateral vantage point is different too. The right pulmonary artery appears circular in cross-section and is situated immediately anterior to the right main stem bronchus, while the left pulmonary artery appears more arc-like or kidney bean shaped in cross-section and is situated immediately on top of the left main stem bronchus. And here's a nice thick sagittal MIP that helps drive home the arc-like shape of the left pulmonary artery. On a lateral chest radiograph, the left pulmonary artery is visible as a short plump arc sitting on top of the black circle formed by the left upper lobe bronchus, while the right pulmonary artery is visible as an oval immediately anterior to the black circle formed by the, upper, by the left upper lobe bronchus. The shadows of the right and left pulmonary arteries are confluent on a lateral chest radiograph forming what you'll perceive as a single fat horseshoe that sits atop of the black circle formed by the left upper lobe bronchus. Now, let's go back to the left pulmonary artery. What's kind of cool is that the left pulmonary artery mimics and parallels the aortic arch on lateral chest radiography, which comes in really helpful for, identify the, for identifying the aortopulmonary window, or AP window, on a lateral chest radiograph. If you can identify the left pulmonary artery and the aortic arch, the lucent negative space between these two structures corresponds to the AP window. At first glance, it would seem impossible to differentiate, to differentiate peripheral pulmonary veins from peripheral pulmonary arteries on a lateral chest radiograph, which is partially, but not entirely true. While it is impossible to differentiate peripheral pulmonary veins from pulmonary arteries in the upper and the lower thirds of the chest on a lateral image, you can sometimes distinguish them in the posterior mid-chest because of the different directions peripheral pulmonary veins travel compared to peripheral pulmonary arteries. Peripheral pulmonary veins in the posterior mid-chest will converge upon the left atrium, while peripheral pulmonary arteries in the posterior mid-chest will converge upon the hyla, which are situated much more superiorly than the heart. 
So you can sometimes distinguish pulmonary veins from pulmonary arteries in the posterior mid chest by observing where they converge to. Although the entire course of the thoracic aorta is invisible on a lateral chest radiograph, we can usually see the aortic arch and upstream through mid descending thoracic aorta. The aortic arch courses from anterior to posterior parallel to the left pulmonary artery and the top margin of the arch will usually be in the vicinity of the T4, T5 interspace and angle of Louis. The descending thoracic aortic segment typically parallels the thoracic spine. The downstream segment of the thoracic aorta is often obscured on a lateral chest radiograph, though you may sometimes pick it up again in some patients as you approach the diaphragm. The superior vena cava is usually not visible on a lateral chest radiograph as its anterior and posterior margins abut mediastinal soft tissue structures rather than air. That being said, it's important to have a general idea of where the SVC may be on a lateral chest radiograph so that you can recognize if a catheter is situated in the SVC like in this patient or not in the SVC um, like in the image on the left side of the screen. The Hickman catheter in the image on the left side of the screen is situated much too anterior for an SVC and is actually in the ascending thoracic aorta, as you can see in these corresponding two sagittal chest CT images. The Asgus arch courses atop the right mainstem bronchus in a relatively transverse course from posterior to anterior, which makes the course of malpositioned central venous catheters in the asgus not ideally visualized on a frontal chest radiograph, but much better visualized on a lateral chest radiograph, as the course of the asgus arch usually overlaps the aortic arch on a lateral chest image. Now, a malpositioned catheter in the left superior intercostal vein is tough to distinguish from a malpositioned catheter in the asgus on a lateral chest radiograph since the position of both will overlie the aortic arch um, in a similar course on a lateral chest radiograph. Fortunately, these two are easily distinguished on a frontal chest radiograph since the asgus arch is on the right side and the left superior intercostal vein is on the left side. The posterior wall of the IVC is often visible on a lateral chest radiograph as a vertical interface extending from the posterior inferior hard border to the, diaph to the hemidiaphragm. A normal esophagus will not be visible on a lateral chest radiograph as its margins abut mediastinal soft tissue structures. However, know that the esophagus parallels the posterior wall of the trachea as demonstrated by the course of the esophageal temperature probe that we showed you on this image earlier. Um, it's important to know this so that you'll recognize when the esophagus is abnormal, like in this case of an air-filled, markedly dilated esophagus immediately posterior to the trachea. The cardiac silhouette is visible in the anterior half of the lower chest. The anterior margin of the cardiac silhouette is formed by the right ventricle, while the upper half of the posterior margin of the cardiac silhouette is formed by the left atrium. The lower half of the posterior margin of the cardiac silhouette is formed by the left ventricle. The pleural space is too thin to see on a normal lateral chest radiograph, though major fissures are sometimes visible as very thin oblique lines, and the minor fissure as a thin transverse line in the anterior mid chest. The right and left lungs will almost perfectly overlap on a lateral chest radiograph. There are three lung regions that should always appear darker than the rest of the lungs on a normal lateral chest radiograph. The first region are the posterior lower lungs. X-ray photons going through the posterior lower lungs on a lateral chest radiograph are passing through a lot of air. Besides the chest wall, however, the only solid structure they pass through is the spine. So this region should look particularly lucent compared to other lung regions. The second region are the lung regions superior to the heart and anterior to the ascending thoracic aorta. Besides the chest wall, the only solid structure X-ray photons will pass through in this region is usually just a small amount of anterior mediastinal fat. So this region should also look particularly lucent compared to other lung regions. Some folks call this region the retrosternal clear space. The third region are the lung regions superior to the heart 
anterior to the spine and posterior to the trachea. Besides the chest wall, the only solid structure X-ray photons will pass through in this region is usually just the esophagus and a small amount of mediastinal fat. So this small region should also look particularly lucent compared to other lung regions. Some folks refer to this region as Raider's Triangle. Ribs will overlie the lungs as multiple contiguous oblique stripes. The cartilaginous portions of the ribs anterior to the costochondral junctions can calcify in heterogeneous ways in older patients that sometimes can mimic lung pathology. Ironically, in older patients, the bony portions of the ribs may appear less conspicuous as bone mineral density decreases. The manubrium and sternum are usually visible in the anterior chest wall on a properly positioned lateral chest radiograph. A short lucent interruption corresponding to the angle Louis is usually, uh, usually visible between the manubrium and sternum. The scapulae appear as two thick parallel vertical bands in many patients, um, bands that overlie the posterior aspects of the upper the posterior aspect of the upper chest. In patients with low bone mineral density and when the scapular blades aren't oriented edge on, sometimes only a cortical margin may be visible and you'll see two parallel lines rather than thick stripes. The thoracic spine on a lateral chest radiograph will appear as a stack of rectangles with a smooth kyphotic curve. Spinous processes are usually obscured on a lateral chest radiograph by the posterior segments of the ribs. Now, the structures we've just walked you through may not necessarily be visible on each and every single lateral chest radiograph you read. It's a good idea to generally know what percent of the time we expect to see different structures. While the trachea and the posterior wall of the bronchus intermedius are visible on practically every lateral chest radiograph, expect to see the black circle of the left upper lobe bronchus in three quarters of images and the black circle of the right upper lobe bronchus in about half of images. The right and left pulmonary arteries should be distinguishable on the large majority of lateral chest radiographs, while we'll see normal fissures about half the time. Now, let's discuss the major landmarks on a lateral chest radiograph and how to locate them. The trachea can be found by starting in the upper chest and looking for a dark, lock, dark long rectangle that's oriented slightly obliquely. If they're present, corrugations along the anterior wall of the rectangle or sequential tracheal cartilage calcifications will help further increase your confidence. The crina on a lateral chest radiograph is usually sighted by starting with the corresponding frontal chest radiograph. Find the crina and measure the distance between the crina and the superior margin of the aortic arch. Now go to the lateral image, find the superior margin of the aortic arch, and locate a point in the tracheal air column that is the same distance inferior. A quick and dirty shortcut for locating the crina on a lateral chest radiograph relies on the observation that the superior margin of the left upper lobe bronchus is usually at around the same level as the crina. So find the black circle that corresponds to the, to the uh, left upper lobe bronchus on your lateral image, and the superior margin of that circle will give you a quick approximation of the location of the carina. The right pulmonary artery is found by starting with the trachea, moving inferiorly to find the left upper lobe bronchus, and then looking for a white oval immediately anterior. The left pulmonary artery is found by starting with the trachea, finding the aortic arch, and then looking for a small plump arc or kidney bean-shaped opacity that parallels the aortic arch inferiorly. The left pulmonary artery should hug the left upper lobe bronchus and form a confluent fat horseshoe with the right pulmonary artery. Pulmonary veins in the posterior mid-chest um, can be identified by bisecting the posterior margin of the cardiac silhouette into superior and inferior halves. Pulmonary veins can be identified as blood vessels in the posterior chest above this bisection line that travel either horizontally or inferiorly as they approach the heart. Aortic and mitral valves can be identified by locating the carina on the lateral image, either the formal way or using the left upper lobe bronchus as a rough approximation and drawing an oblique line from the carina to the anterior costophrenic angle. Cardiac valves posterior to this line will be mitral valves, while aortic and tricuspid valves will be anterior to this line. Interstitial lung opacities are fine opacities that can be easily obscured by 
a lot of the overlapping soft tissue structures on a lateral image. However, if you're trying to find them on a lateral image, the highest yield lung region to check for will be the retrosternal clear space. In this patient, you might notice that there are some fine interstitial opacities in the retrosternal clear space, which correspond to fine reticular interstitial opacities in the anterior left upper lobe. The sidedness of ribs can sometimes be identified on a lateral image if you know which side of the patient was closer to the image detector when the chest radiograph was acquired. In the United States, it's usually customarily, customary to shoot lateral chest radiographs with the patient's left side against the detector. Because the other set of ribs will be further from the detector and therefore appear magnified, the set of posterior ribs on a lateral image that appears slightly larger will correspond to those ribs, which for us here in the United States are usually the right ribs. The angle of Louis, which can serve as a landmark for the superior mediastinal space, can be found in the anterior chest wall where the manubrium and sternum meet. On lateral chest radiographs, we can sometimes number vertebral bodies using the angle of Louis as a landmark, since the second rib usually articulates with the manubrial sternal junction. If you designate the rib that articulates with the manubrial sternal junction as rib two and are able to follow it all the way posterior to a vertebral body, that will give you a good guess for what is the T2 vertebral body. Now, a few useful tips for reading lateral chest radiographs. Be careful when identifying the trachea on a lateral chest radiograph since in some patients, the relatively lucent region between the blades of both scapulae can resemble a tracheal air column. Check for corrugations along the anterior margin of the air column or the presence of another long, dark vertical rectangle nearby to make sure you're not being fooled. In patients who happen to have a dilated air-filled esophageal lumen, make sure you check the thickness of the tracheal esophageal soft tissue stripe between the esophageal and tracheal air columns. If the width is over five millimeters or you see focal widening of that stripe, you may want to consider getting a chest CT to find out why. Because of the relatively long length of the right pulmonary artery, it should appear as one of the densest structures on a lateral chest radiograph. Always do a subconscious check to make sure that the right pulmonary artery looks slightly denser than the left pulmonary artery. If the left pulmonary artery looks denser than usual, you may need to find out why. Remember, you can use the aortic arch and left pulmonary artery to find each other since they form a set of parallel big and small plump arcs. Also remember to check the lucent negative space between these two arcs for any evidence of an AP window mass. As a chest radiologist, I hate giving volume estimates for pleural effusions on chest radiographs because it can often be quite inaccurate. However, if your back is against the wall, use these guidelines. If the lateral and posterior costophrenic sulci are sharp on both the upright PA and lateral, I'll say there's no pleural effusion. If the posterior sulcus is blunted on the lateral, but the lateral sulcus is sharp on the PA, I'll say the volume is under a cup. If the lateral sulcus is blunted on the frontal, the posterior sulcus will almost always be blunted unless the pleural effusion is loculated. Provided the pleural effusion is not loculated, a pleural effusion that blunts the lateral costophrenic sulcus on a PA image, upright PA image, that doesn't surpass the top of the hemidiaphragm will be between a cup and a pint in volume, while one that surpasses the top of the hemidiaphragm will usually be over a qu half quart in volume. The final part of this talk will be an illustration of a visual search pattern you can use when reading a lateral chest radiograph. We'll start with the chest wall and abdomen. Check the cortical margins and density of the sternum and manubrium. Then check the margins and densities of each vertebral body and its lamina. Now do the same thing for each set of posterior ribs. And finally, check the contour of the hemidiaphragms, making sure you also take a peek at the upper abdominal contents below the hemidiaphragms. During this part of the search, you may find something as common as flattened hemidiaphragms, which can help you identify COPD in older patients. Uh, the pulmonary arteries are also enlarged on this image too, but we'll get to that a little later. Um, here's two more patients with uh, similar findings. The lungs are hyperexpanded due to emphysema in this patient, while in this patient, um, the lungs are hyperexpanded due to lymphangioliomyomatosis, uh, which is much less common than COPD, but also associated with hyperexpanded lungs. Note that there are also retroperitoneal surgical clips as this patient had a rather nasty AML resection too. During this part of the search, you might 
also pick up something like dense vertebral body end plates in this patient with secondary hyperparathyroidism, or really dense vertebral body end plates like in this young patient with osteopetrosis. You might notice a rather posteriorly displaced sternum, like in this patient with severe pectus excavatum, or a rather sudden collapse of two contiguous mid-thoracic vertebral bodies and loss of their intervertebral disc space in this patient with vertebral osteomyelitis and discitis. The visual search then moves on to the pleural space, beginning at the apex and follow the anterior margin of the lungs inferiorly to the diaphragm. You're looking for any evidence that something's preventing the lung from expanding all the way to meet the inner surface of the rib cage. Once you get to the anterior costophrenic angle, follow the inferior lung margins posteriorly to the posterior costophrenic angle and head up the posterior lung margins back to the apex. Now, do a quick spot check of the lung fields for anything that could resemble a fissural pleural fluid accumulation or pleural plaques. Sometimes you'll pick up very conspicuous blunting of the anterior and posterior costophrenic angles that prevents the inferior lung from reaching its full territorial, territorial extent like in this patient with a pleural effusion, or this patient with a holly leaf-like opacity due to a calcified asbestos-related pleural plaque. Or perhaps something like in this patient, where we see focal pleural fluid accumulation along a major fissure. Our visual search pattern then moves on to the lungs. We'll start at the apex and scan from top to bottom. We'll then do a double check of the three regions where lungs should always appear more lucent than the remainder of the lung on a lateral chest radiograph. The, the retrosternal clear space, radius triangle, and the posterior lower lungs. Sometimes you'll see an opacity where the lung should appear lucent, like a posterior lower lobe opacity in this patient with round atelectasis, or this patient with obstructive left upper lobar atelectasis in the setting of a central left lung tumor, or this lower lobe mass in a patient ultimately diagnosed with a left lower lobe lung adenocarcinoma, or a solitary lung nodule that's obscured by the anterior left first rib on the frontal image that was fortunately diagnosed as a hamartoma on chest CT. After the lung, you'll inspect the central airways beginning at the anterior neck base, going down the anterior margin of the tracheal air column, then up the posterior margin of the tracheal air column, followed by a scan of the tracheal air column itself. From the lower tracheal air column, you'll inspect the hyla, inspect the right pulmonary artery from top to bottom, and then inspect the left pulmonary artery from anterior to superior, and then finish with a check of the left upper lobar and right upper lobe bronchi. Maybe you'll encounter a right pulmonary artery foreign body like this embolized atrial septal closure device, or this patient with a massively enlarged right pulmonary artery. Your visual search is almost done once it's time to inspect the mediastinum, which you'll do as a scan that starts from the neck and moves down the entire chest, followed by a quick double check of the AP window. Perhaps you'll pick up an anterior mediastinal mass that despite its size was easier to miss on the PA image. Um, this particular mass was ultimately diagnosed as a thymoma. Your visual search of the lateral image finishes with the heart. You'll start in the anterior upper chest following the anterior margin of the cardiac silhouette, its inferior margin, and then its posterior margin back up to where you started. You'll pay attention to the overall density of the cardiac silhouette, whose density should gradually decrease as your gaze shifts superiorly. Perhaps you'll see an opacity overlying the cardiac silhouette, like this pericardial cyst, or an oreo sign along the anterior margin of the cardiac silhouette, corresponding to a pericardial effusion. Now it's your turn.